shake it up a little bit because I know we've been sitting for a long time. Um, so we're going to do a little bit of interactivity, a tiny bit at the beginning and then more at the end. So get ready for that. Um, as Zach said, I'm Jen. Just to give you my background, I am double big red, thus the red blazer. Um, and I spent, I've spent about 15 years leading big teams at three of the big tech companies, Yahoo, Google, and Facebook. I've also done two startups, one of which I was running last time I spoke at this conference that we uh, later ended up selling to Google. I spent five years running change.org and helping it become profitable and scale around the world. And now I also teach two classes at the business school at Stanford, which we lovingly call the Cornell of the West. They, they don't love it when I call it that, but I do. <laughs> so that's my background. And as I said, we're going to start with some interactivity. So I would like, if this applies to you, and if you are able, please stand. Otherwise, raise your hand. I am building or work for an AI company. Anybody? OK. Stand up if you can so I can see you. Look around, see who's building or working for an AI company. Thank you. OK, next. I already use AI a lot at work or school. Stand up. OK, look around. OK, how about I already use AI a lot personally? Like outside of work or school, I just use it personally. OK, same people, a few people sitting down. OK, and what about this one? AI, eh, not so much yet. Anybody? No shame in this? No shame. Yeah. OK, a few people. So a range in the room. It helps me to get a sense of where people are before we start talking about this topic, because it is one of those things that has a really wide range of how much experience and knowledge people have about it. So I'm going to start with a little bit of background, some of my own personal history with AI. And then we'll talk about how AI can and cannot help us both for entrepreneurs and then also as leaders. And then we're going to end with an interactive exercise that everyone's going to do together on your phones. OK, so my first startup, the one that I was running last time I spoke at this conference, was called The Deal Map. We actually, it was called, before it was called The Deal Map, it was called Centered. It was a, a long, futile exercise in multiple failures before we hit something that was successful. The third product we built was this AI product where we scanned 40 million local reviews and we used natural language processing and AI to structure the data that came out of it. This is super painful to look at iPhone UI from like 2008 with that little rolly thing. But um, you can see we pulled out data about these restaurants and local businesses and so forth. Quick entrepreneurial tangent, which is that this product was a failure for me as an entrepreneur. It was a great product. It, you know, this was in the age when everyone was first getting the iPhone and you didn't want to read. Everything was 4.5 stars and you didn't want to read 500 reviews on your iPhone. But I couldn't get anyone to use this. I didn't have money to market it, et cetera. So I actually licensed this data to local search providers. They were super excited. They wanted to pay me for it, which was awesome. And then I woke up one day and realized I had sold to all of them. Like when they talk about pro product market fit, and part of it is finding a big enough market, I missed that thing. <laughs> like everybody bought it, and there was no one more to sell it to. So we had to pivot. We built a different product, turned out to be very successful. But the interesting thing is sometimes as an entrepreneur, we don't know that the things that we fail at can still succeed elsewhere. So two years after that, Google bought our product, the, the product we built next, which was about location-based deals. But they also took all of this that we had built. And so now when you go into restaurants or businesses and they say, oh, this is good for kids or casual, like that's what we built. And now it's in front of billions of people. So the thing that felt like a failure to me turned out not to really be a failure after all. Anyway, that was my first experience with AI. After that, I spent. Um, a few years at Facebook, I ran groups and community for Facebook. One of the things we were responsible for was taking bad content out of groups. As you might imagine, we heavily used AI for this. We, I also had a team of 500 people that worked on this because we could build awesome AI algorithms, but the algorithms didn't know what to look for. And so human beings had to look for things like this. This is someone trying to sell a gun um, as a bottle of baby powder. 
which is one of the patterns that people use a lot is they say they're selling something else when they're really selling something illegal. So the truth is AI was extremely helpful, but we didn't yet have the right tools to avoid humans in the process. And honestly, I cannot wait for the day that AI takes over this entire process because it's really difficult work for humans to look at this kind of stuff on the internet. It's really, really hard. So some, some jobs will be better done completely by machines. Okay, so just I'm not gonna I'm only gonna do two slides on sort of the, the progression of AI, but in case for people who are less familiar, AI has been around a long time, actually, since about the 50s. This is a chart that measures flops, floating, operating points of how many arithmetic computations are done in a particular model. And you can see that in 1950, the model started with like 40 flops. And now in the past you know, 10 years, we're now at 3 billion petaflops, which is 1,000 million million. We're at 3 billion, 1,000 million million, so a, a lot. And the thing that you can see is how fast the um, computation power has grown in the past 10 years. So this used to grow at, this, at the rate of Moore's Law, which is doubling every 20 months. In the past 10 years, it's been doubling every six months. So this is why what we're seeing is just so dramatically different than what we saw before. It also has now gotten better than humans as measured against humans on things, everything from speech recognition to image recognition to language understanding. This chart was made, I think, 2021. So it's already much better than, than us at a lot of things, which is part of the reason why it's so scary to a lot of people. But there's so many great things that can come from it. So the big difference and what really excites me personally is the, the emergence of generative AI so many of the things I wanted to build back in those days just were not possible. Even with all the great AI tools we had then, we can build so much more now. And so the question is not whether to use it, it's how to use it. And the first part is how do we think about it as entrepreneurs? So I thought I would show you this. I, I don't know how many of you will build SaaS companies. My company is a SaaS company. This is the, what they call the funding napkin, which is what you need to have in order to get funded in 2023. And you can see the bottom line there. You may not be able to read that, but it says AI strategy. Like actually to get funded as any kind of software company now, you need an AI strategy. And it will come up in almost every conversation. 50% of investors have said it's more important than ever before to have a convincing AI strategy. And the question is, what is, what is a persuasive AI story? What will, what will work? And so there are three elements, really. One is that you need access to proprietary data. So this tweet, which you may not be able to read, is someone talking about how they were, you know, someone was upset because they had built an AI extension that reads PDFs and translates them and interprets them and so forth. And then OpenAI launched something that reads PDFs. And the person was saying, how was it that you thought that reading a PDF was a good business model? Because it, it really isn't. That's so copyable by anybody. And so the idea is that a persuasive AI story is something that's not easily copyable by others. And the best way to do that is by having some proprietary data and having it differentiated and integrated. So one idea for those who are earlier in the journey is to think about how to educate yourself and your teams. My team, for instance, we did a whole AI boot camp for everyone in the company, and we also did AI hackathon that everybody participated in. And there are so many free resources. We can send these out after where you can. The best thing about AI, actually, is that you don't have to be an engineer to use it, right? Anybody can learn prompting and work with AI to create the kinds of things that weren't possible before. OK, so then the real question and the main topic for this talk is, what is how does AI help us as leaders and with our leadership? And so I wanted to start with, what does great leadership look like? And for anyone in this room who wants to be a founder, pretty much you will have to do all of these things. So I call it the six C's of leadership. The first is, and I often compare this to great sports coaches because really great leaders of companies look a lot like great sports coaches. So the first thing is communicating a really compelling vision of where you're going and how you'll get there and what the goals are. And we've heard about that all day from various 
speakers. The second is communicating that clear path over and over again and helping people see how their role fits in. The third, coaching each individual team member to their optimal performance. The fourth is delivering results, competing with other companies, then connecting people so they feel like a team and committing to keep going. So these are the six C's. We're gonna quickly talk about each one and how well AI can help us with it. So I'm gonna go through one by one. The first one is creating a vision. And I will tell you, I was actually really surprised by this because my first instinct was, no, AI is not gonna be able to do this. And we heard all day, there's, there are some things AI won't do, one of which is help you really identify a problem that you feel passionate about and help you find a vision that you're personally excited about. AI is not gonna do that. But boy, once you pick that thing, can AI help you communicate and wordsmith the hell out of a vision statement. So I, as an example, asked this, and I can't read it from here, create an inspiring vision for a new startup based on helping people sleep better. And in like 30 seconds, I had not only a vision statement, but the name of a company, a tagline, some values. And then I asked another question and I thought, God, why did I spend so long writing the outline for my company? Because this would have done it a lot faster. Now, granted, a bunch of what's in here is rehashed from old things because AI is a mix of things that have been created before. But especially for people who feel like you don't always know exactly what to say or how to word something, it can really help even on very visionary things. Okay, the second thing is communicating a clear path to success. So once I have my vision, how can I get there? AI can really help lay out the steps for us it can't help us actually do those steps and test what's going to work. But in terms of you know, helping us set initial goals and so forth, it can, it can be quite helpful. Okay, so now we get into the really interesting thing. How can AI help us understand and coach each person on our team? And also to the point you made before, how does it help us find the right people in the first place, attract them, et cetera. We'll talk about that more in a minute. But as an example, one of the things we build at Rising Team is tools that help leaders understand and team members understand each other around factors like motivators, which we're gonna do an activity on in a minute, talents, appreciation preferences, long-term career horizons, et cetera. AI won't know those things about the people on your team. So we have to find them out by asking or using other tools. Once AI knows those things though, it can help us a lot in being better coaches for them. So this is a prototype of something we have working now. We call it RD, like RT for Rising Team, very clever naming by someone on my team, um, where we download all, you know, we input all the latest research and, and science best practices on leadership, and then we input all the data we have about people from their Rising Team exercises, and it can spit out then personalized coaching scripts for each person that's based on their unique needs. So that's a way that Rising, that, um, AI can help, and here's the other thing, is it can help you practice. So this is a tool I actually use in my calls, a lot, oftentimes really helpful for salespeople, and it watches me in the video, and then it tells me how many you know, filler words, what was my longest monologue, and it helps me practice and rates me every time, and so I can get better as long as I use the tool. So in terms of understanding people, we need to do a little bit of work. Once we have that data, we can, um, we can get scripts and we can practice those scripts. The challenge with it, and the reason I only give AI the half circle on this one, is that it can't help you really in person, right? So this is my class and we get asked at the beginning of each quarter to make a policy on AI and whether students are allowed to use AI in our class. I always say, yes, of course you can use AI. I mean, it's part of, of what everyone is going to use in their lives now. The challenge is that our class is all about role plays. We bring in guests, we take their cha most challenging work situations. You can use AI to write your initial script, but as soon as you get into a role play with me, 
you have no idea what I'm going to say. And that's true of everyone we work with. So I pull up this quote that Reggie and I were talking about last night. Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. And that's the thing. It's like we cannot get too dependent on AI here because AI can only help us start the conversation. It can't help us complete the conversation with another human being. OK, compete. This is where AI gets almost the full circle. And you know, Heather's example of nine months to nine days of translating the 1950 census is a good one. I have this example where you know, when I worked at change.org, it used to take us months to translate the site into every language for each country that we moved into. We needed to hire a whole team. We spent tens of thousands of dollars per language. We had individual people checking it. You know, This we built in our hackathon for Rising Team one day all of these languages, we had, including Pig Latin, if you can see it on there, which was someone's funny joke. Um, and I had real language speakers test it, and they said it was you know, 95% there. So we still will need a little bit of human being work on top of this, but not nearly as much. So the competitive factor is really, really benefited there. OK, and then commit. So you know, part of, I actually at first thought this is another place AI can't help us. Like We have to find our internal inner reserves to be able to keep standing up over and over again when things get hard. And then I thought about it more and did a little bit more research. And I do think there's actually a lot here that AI can help us with. So there are all kinds of apps that can help us coach us on our own personal resilience. Can, you know, we can practice five minutes a day, et cetera. It can help. We still need to do the work to have that internal strength. And the other factor that's really important here is it's not just our own resilience. We have to remember, especially when we are leaders of teams and leaders of companies, that anything could be happening on any given day with the people we work with. Like I, I sometimes do an exercise around this where I ask people to stand up if certain difficult things have happened to them. And I won't do it today, but it's like, I'll say one of the questions so you can think about it in your mind. I sometimes say, how many people here who have been called at work or school with serious medical news about yourself or someone you love? And like 80% of the room stands up on that question. So we don't know as leaders what anyone is going through on any given day. This is data from one of our rising team sessions where you can see people rating their own resilience on different levels and then saying whether it's higher or lower than usual. And you can see there's a bit large number of people who are feeling low that day and feeling worse than usual that day. And so no matter how much we boost our own resilience, we have to remember that other people's may not be as high. And this is, again, a human connection issue. OK, so at the end of the day, it can help us with so much. The thing that it really can't help us do is the, the true human thing. And I have a short video here to, to make this point. How many people here have seen Maverick? Anybody? OK, I don't think I will spoil it for everybody else. I will say I was, I was a teenager when the first Top Gun came out, so I'm a especially big Top Gun fan. But this is one scene from Maverick that makes this point. Oh. Sir, what is this? It's dogfight football, offense and defense at the same time. Who's winning? I think they stopped keeping score a while ago. This detachment still has some training to complete, Captain. Every available minute matters. Yes, sir. So why are we out here playing games? We said to create a team, sir. There's your team. So at the end of the day, we cannot create really strong teams without having that human connection factor. We can create more effective, faster working, more productive teams, but they won't feel like a team unless we spend time making connections with each other. I personally think that games are one way to do that, and then there are some deeper connecting things we can do and should do in addition. So. Um, Part of the reason this stuff is important is because the workplace has turned upside down. And you know, some of you are just going into the workplace now, but for many of us, it's like all of a sudden, everybody, you know, three quarters of people work in hybrid offices, employee engagement's super low, managers are like burned out and totally overwhelmed. And so um, one of the things that we teach in my class is that in order to be a good leader of people, and also in order to be happiest and most fulfilled in our own careers, 
we need to understand the motivators of people, right? And so I actually built this tool like 20 years ago. I started using it with my teams. And part of the reason why is because I had a woman on my team who said to me one day, if I ever do a good job at something, just pay me more money. She's like, I don't care about any of that recognition stuff, just like a little spot bonus or something. And I thought, oh my gosh, like that is incredibly crass that she just told me that. And I was kind of taken aback. And then I went home and I thought about it overnight. And I thought, if she hadn't told me, I would never know what she actually cared about. And I would just be recognizing her in the way that mattered to me, which is completely irrelevant for her. And so it was so helpful that I developed this, you know, at the time, probably Excel spreadsheet. I think this is even before Google spreadsheets. And I would just give it to everybody and I'd say, you have an empty circle, put whatever you want in it. Like whatever factors you care about at any weighting or size, and then color code it red, yellow, green on how happy you are on this item right now. And it turns out to be an incredibly useful tool for a variety of reasons. One is that it helps me understand people. And so if, if you use a tool like this as a leader, it can help us say, to your example about hiring, this came up in one of my office hours. It's like, how do I persuade someone to work at my, at my company? Well, the first thing is you have to have a really compelling vision that gets them excited. The second thing is you have to know what they care about. Because for some people, comp will be a huge thing that matters to them. And for other people, they want more equity or they want more scope or they're coming out of a big company and they want more autonomy. And if we don't ask them, we won't know. And the other thing is it helps us as individuals. Like I, I fill one of these out and I have everyone on my team fill it out every six months or so, so that I, I know and it helps me make job choices and so forth. So we are going to practice together. We're gonna to actually each make one of these charts right now. I'm going to give you a QR code in a minute that you'll scan on your phone. We're going to make one. If you are not working currently, if you're a student, you can fill it out as in your ideal, what you would like your ideal chart to look like. And you can rate the color coding based on, say, your last summer job or something like that. OK, and then once we fill them out, we're also going to do a little bit of sharing in the room in pairs. So we're going to practice two things. One is you know, classifying our own motivators, and the other is deeply listening to another human being about what they care about. Because this is, you know, my, the summary of all of this is AI is gonna do a ton of stuff that we used to do before that we won't have to, but this is the one thing it won't do. So this is why I want us to practice it today. Okay, so. Okay, so if you see that QR code, Please scan that. It is going to ask you for to enter your email and make a password. The reason for that is that I'm going to give you a free version of this to take home and use with your own team of your choosing if you want to. So you won't have to use it, and I'm not going to spam you with stuff. But if you want it, that's why it's asking you to make a password. OK. So we're going to wait as people join, and then we'll go to the next step. So wait on that clock page when you get in. <laughs> Sorry for the super cheesy music. It's the only thing I can afford right now. <laughs> And I have to say, this very techie crowd is much faster at getting into this product. Like a lot of people take a really long time. OK. So keep going. If you're not in, that's, oops, that's absolutely fine. This is the problem I had earlier. OK. So we are going to go to this activity now. You can go to the next page. You will see that you have your own pie chart. There are a variety of categories you can choose from. There's also an other at the bottom if something's missing. And you can assign up to 12 total slices. You can give more than one slice to anything that you care about a lot. And we will fill that out. I'm going to put on more cheesy music while you fill that out. There's a second page where you rate your satisfaction on each item. When you are done with those two things, 
wait on that page. Don't go past that page with your own chart on it. If you're not finished, keep going. I'm gonna to go to the next page. Just please stay on the page you're on, even if you're finished. I wanna show us this first. So this is the aggregate view of the 70 or so people who had submitted so far. If I were to refresh, it would um, show up again. I should have brought my glasses because I cannot see this. Okay, so we have compensation as the most important item to the people in this room, which is not surprising. We have a lot of um, you know, early career people here where, where compensation often matters. You can also see that that is a yellow face, so average is just neutral on that. Um, the people we work with are the next most important, and then autonomy and growth, which both, which all of which are green on average, so that's really nice. And then we have other, you know, others always going to show up over there because they're all different, so I wouldn't count that. But the slightly less important things right now our mastery, which again, early career mastery tends to be less important, um, and responsibility. So we're gonna go to the next page because one of the things that sometimes is misleading about averages is that they're averages, right? So it's great to get an org look because you can see the summary, but if we look down underneath the averages, we can see that for example, compensation, even though the average was neutral, there are some people who are very satisfied here with 11% of people super satisfied with their compensation and 25% pretty satisfied. And vice versa, on this one where autonomy is green on average, we also have 19% neutral, 6% unsatisfied, and 3% very unsatisfied. So it is important to both look at the roll-up of the group and then dig in a little bit. So now what I want you to do is you are gonna pair up with a neighbor and you're going to share whatever you're comfortable with on your motivators. And I want you to practice you know, you may know this person well, you may not. Just try to listen to them and understand what they care about and think about how you might, you know, work with them if they were a colleague or um, a friend. Okay, I'm gonna skip this page. So you should be, oh, this is my own personal motivator chart in case anyone cares about it. I put it in here. I put responsibility as a yellow because as a startup CEO, I say I'm my own intern. So <laughs> I'm like, okay. So you will be on this page sharing, and I'm gonna give you, yeah, five minutes to share with your neighbor. So each direction, pick a, pick a neighbor to share with and share your charts, and then we're gonna come back as a group. Okay, so what I would like is, oh my gosh, we already have four volunteers. I did not even ask, I did not even explain, but yes, high tech audience figures this out. So we're gonna call on some volunteers to see how this felt. John, you're up first. Can we get a mic to John? Where are you? Can you stand up? John, did you raise your, did you raise your hand in the app? How did he do it when he's not here? I know. Okay, we'll go to the next person. It's kind of scary. Yeah. Jamie, Jamie Poole. Okay. Please stand up and introduce yourself and then share your thought. Um, hi. Uh, yeah, so I'm um, sharing my motivators. Uh, did you actually want me to share the chart? or No, you don't just... have to share the chart. Just share any insights or takeaways you got. From okay, yeah. Process. I think like dividing my motivators into like different categories and like getting to kind of think about like what 
which of those categories are more important to me. Uh, currently, I'm actually searching for a new job, so like actually being able to think about that as I go into the job search process is actually really helpful for me. Um, so I think that uh, kind of trying to prioritize certain um, certain values over others and trying to fig figure out what is more uh, important what is important to me, um, I think I think is really helpful, and I think that this is a really interesting process. Thank you, I appreciate yeah, that. Thank you. Okay, let's see who's next. And also, I'm curious to hear how it felt having someone listen to you describe these. Okay, Martha, you're up next. Where's Martha? Is Martha here? <laughs> There's some ghost this is really volunteers. Weird. How could my... you have done the exercise and then left? <laughs> <laughs> and also raise your hand. Maybe they What's, change their mind. Raise what mic? Their hand. Oh, there's oh, some online. online oh, from online. Oh. Well, that's that's tough. Can well, they, go ahead. Okay. No, they can't. They can't. Okay, so I'm going to need some other volunteers. <laughs> I'm, I'm cutting that off. Jack Chen, are you in the room? You're online. Wow. Oh, in the back. In the back. Where's Jack? Great. Yeah. Okay. Um, I feel like uh, uh, this helped me to kind of test out myself as a. Uh, uh, like a founder for the startup and then I'm trying to see what I you know feel happy about accomplish my goal and I also work with my people yeah. and my team yes that's great I do as I said I have my team fill these out like every six months because I spot the things that are yellow you know before they're ready to quit which is usually when those things come up okay Zach Gould okay um, well, first, sharing my motivators felt a little bit vulnerable, but it really gave me a good opportunity to think about myself, and I definitely learned that I value a well-rounded um, uh, motivations, and, and when I was picking things, taking something away from something else made me feel like... Like, well, I, I value that too. So I actually just put one for everything. <laughs> okay. You know, yeah, this so is a good thing to learn about myself. Yeah, that's true. It's really interesting. Some people, like I have had seen people who put 50-50, yeah. like six in one and six in the other and nothing else is on their chart. And a little bit of everything is, yeah, a different approach and right. that works for you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. The vulnerable piece is interesting too, because again, this is the, I know this is supposed to be a presentation on AI. I'm sneaking in a presentation on the importance of human connection into my AI piece. But that's the point is, you know, the, the more we do everything with machines, the less good we're going to be at this stuff. And so it's really important to keep practicing it. Okay, we'll do one more. Hamid. Okay, over here in the front. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, for my motivations, compensation, I'm going to be honest. Yeah. For sure. No shame in uh, that. But the next one was autonomy because mm. like I would mention that I can do the task on my own pace and my own comfort. And I experienced that over the summer when I had my internship. Um, I was like cooking while doing some of the tasks. And that was like, that was, I felt freedom. I, I felt like, okay, now I do what I like. While, yeah. while doing what I need. So like at the mm. same time, I'm not restricted, I'm not limited. And um, that is why I weighted that a little heavier. Yeah, I like it. It's true. And also these, the other thing about these is they change over time. And this is why to keep doing them, especially you know, as you get to different life stages, things matter more or less as you change jobs, move cities, et cetera. So thank you for your very thoughtful participation in that. Um, I am going to ask you, if you don't mind, there's a survey page that's at the end there. That way we get a little bit of feedback if you fill that out. I appreciate it. And then that will be the end. I'm going to go back to the presentation now and just sum up by saying this is the winning formula in, in my mind and based on all the research I've seen, which is that AI is going to help us do so many things in our lives and in our work faster, better, easier, and we absolutely should be taking advantage of this. And the big learning for me in going through all the leadership vectors is that it's often really surprising how much better it is than what I think it will do. And so that's probably true for all of us. Like, try AI first. But the winning formula is AI plus human connection. And for all of you who are leaders today or want to be leaders tomorrow, we have to be 
continuously developing our soft skills and our empathy and making that better and better because without that, we just won't be able to be great leaders. So that's it. There's a QR code. As I said, you get a free version of this if you want to run it with any team. It's, it's a small group version. You can't do a, a hundred something group, but you can do up to 14 people if you have friends or if you have a small team you want to do it with, you can use that QR code. Um, and with that, I don't know if I have any time for questions or not, but. We can do, we can do one or two. Did, does anybody have any questions for Jen? I know we all just participated with her. Yeah, go ahead. It doesn't have to be about this topic, too. It can be about whatever. Yeah, great, great presentation and workshop. Thank you. Um, I'm curious what actionable lessons managers can take away when it comes to seeing discontent in their team. Are there good levers for everything because some of them are somewhat um, ephemeral and some of them seem kind of tied to the position that you are doing or yeah. the work that needs to get That's done. That's true. So this is a really good point. If you go look at someone's motivators chart and you see a bunch of red on there, as a manager, there will be certain things that are in your control to help with and there'll be other things that are not. And so the key, the first number one most important thing is listening. Because sometimes it's just being asked that matters and being able to express the things that are bothering you. And the people that work on your team know that you can't fix everything on there. And then some of the things you can fix, like autonomy is a good example that Hamid said. It is possible for us to give people more autonomy that they have, give them a little more runway, see how they do. Compensation, of course, harder to affect. but. The more you do this with more people, the more data you have to take it up in your organization and share it and maybe do something about it by talking to other people. And what I will say is that as they change over time, like I see it is so clear, for instance, people might have something like title or promotion as a big slice on their thing. And then as soon as they get promoted, it's totally gone. It disappears from their pie altogether for you know a couple of years usually. So. Excellent. Jennifer, thanks, thanks so yeah, much sure. for coming. It was awesome. Yeah, thank you.